Hi everyone, this lesson is an overview of migraine headaches. So we're gonna talk about risk factors and causes of migraine headaches. We're also gonna talk about signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So migraine headaches are pulsatile in unilateral head pain that is often disabling and occurs with associated symptoms. We're gonna talk about all of these in more detail later on in this lesson. Now migraine headaches occur in a large portion of the population. It's estimated that 10 to 15% of the general population is affected by migraine headaches. And the highest prevalence of migraine headaches appears to occur in North America. Now, the onset of migraine headaches appears to occur in puberty, and the prevalence increases with increasing age until approximately 40 years of age. So migraine headaches tend to begin in puberty, and then they start to taper off later on in life. Now, some risk factors for getting migraine headaches include genetic predispositions. So if there's a family history, particularly a first degree family member like a parent or sibling that has migraine headaches, you're more likely to also have migraine headaches yourself. And then there are particular dietary and environmental triggers that can cause migraine headaches as well. And some of these include MSG or monosodium glutamate, chocolate, alcohol. Some environmental triggers may include bright lights and changes in weather. If you want more information on these triggers, please check out my full lessons on dietary triggers of migraine headaches and environmental triggers of migraine headaches. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology behind a migraine headache. Why do migraine headaches actually occur? So it appears that triggers we talked about before, like chocolate and monosodium glutamate, they cause the release of vasoactive neuropeptides. So these vasoactive neuropeptides include neurokinin A, substance P, and CGRP. And this leads to abnormal vasodilation. This is what is believed to occur in a migraine headache. And there may also be an underlying sterile inflammation as well. And then what also appears to happen is that there can be some trigeminal nerve activation and some pain response due to that activation. And then along with this, there may also be some neuronal impairment as well. And the release of a lot of these vasoactive neuropeptides appears to be related to 5-HT1 receptor activity or the serotonin receptor activity. So there are many different serotonin receptors, but we're going to just generalize it here with the 5-HT1 receptor. Now, before we actually get into the symptoms of a migraine headache, it's important to understand that a migraine headache goes through certain phases. There are actually four phases of a migraine headache. The first phase of a migraine headache is known as the prodrome. The second phase is known as the aura. The third phase is the headache itself. And the fourth phase is the postrome. And we're going to go into the details of each of these in the next few slides. So in phase one, the prodrome, three quarters of patients suffer from the prodromal phase. So not all patients that experience migraine headaches will experience a prodrome, but a majority will. And the symptoms of the prodrome of a migraine headache include yawning, changes in mood, lethargy, photophobia and phonophobia. So photophobia is sensitivity to light. Phonophobia is sensitivity to sound. Cold insensitivity, so feeling very cold, having certain food cravings, and then having excessive thirst. Now, after the patient has experienced phase one or the prodrome, they may experience the aura, which is phase two. A quarter of patients will have aura. Now, as you can see, not all patients will experience aura, and in fact, only a minority of patients will. And if a patient does experience an aura, it's gradual and occurs for less than 60 minutes. And what is noted is that a visual aura is most common. So seeing different things. And one visual aura symptom that can occur in patients who are experiencing an aura with a migraine headache is what we call a scintillating scotoma. So a scintillating scotoma is a spot that flickers and shines and essentially blocks your vision in particular area of your visual field. So this can be something that can occur in patients who are experiencing a visual aura. Some patients can also see certain shapes that can also block and impair their vision as well. And some patients may reduce their ability to see with a visual aura as well. Now there can be other symptoms that can occur. These include positive and negative symptoms. So some of these can include bright areas in your visual field, sounds like tinnitus, that's the ringing in the ears I just mentioned. And in some patients, they may have loss of certain sensory inputs. So they may have some reduction or loss of hearing or reduction or loss in vision during these auras. Now after the aura or phase two, we move on to phase three, which is the actual headache. Now the headache itself is described as pulsatile or throbbing, and it is 
oftentimes going to be unilateral. It's going to be on one side of the head. And it's going to be a pounding headache. It's often going to be described as moderate to severe in intensity. And oftentimes it can be very severe. And it can last anywhere from 4 to 72 hours. So it can last for days. This headache is worsened with physical activity. It's worsened with certain environmental factors like bright lights. And it's oftentimes improved with rest and improved with being in darker environments. And some associated symptoms that can occur with the headache include photophobia, phonophobia. So photophobia, again, is that sensitivity to light. Phonophobia is the sensitivity to sound. And then nausea and vomiting can occur as well. So these oftentimes can go along with the headache. And then once a patient has gone through phase three, they enter into phase four, which is the postrome. The postrome can last up to 24 hours after completion of the headache. Patients will describe feeling exhausted, so they'll feel very tired. They can feel irritable. They can have poor concentration, and they can have dizziness as well. Now let's talk about how migraine headaches are diagnosed. The diagnosis of migraine headaches is often used by criteria from the International Classification of Headache Disorders, or ICHD-3. So with regards to a migraine without aura, a patient requires at least five attacks. So they would have had to have had at least five episodes of a migraine without aura. So a lot of these are going to be the symptoms we just talked about. Headache lasting four to 72 hours, especially if that headache is untreated. If it's treated, it may be shortened. Headache with at least two of the following, including a characteristic pulsatile or throbbing nature. Headache that is unilateral, so on one side of the head. And that headache is exacerbated by physical activity or causes a patient to avoid routine activity. And the headache is described to be moderate to severe in intensity. And the headache itself occurs with at least one of the following, nausea and or vomiting in photophobia and phonophobia. So again, we need this time requirement. We need at least two of these and we need at least one of these. And there would have had to be at least five attacks in order to say this patient has migraine without aura. Now, according to the same criteria, a migraine with aura requires at least two attacks. And there is additional criteria that is required. So we need the criteria we just talked about in the last slide, but we need this additional criteria as well. So one or more of the following aura symptoms must be present. These include visual, sensory, speech and language, motor, brainstem, and retinal. So there has to be some aura in one of these categories. And then at least three of the following must be present as well. One or more aura symptoms that gradually spreads over the course of five minutes. Two or more aura symptoms that occur one after the other. Each aura symptom lasts five to 60 minutes. At least one aura symptom is unilateral, so it's one-sided. At least one aura symptom is positive, and an aura occurs with migraine headache or 60 minutes prior to onset of the headache. So it's not going to occur after the headache has resolved. So at least three of the following are required. And there's another type of migraine headache that can occur as well, and this is known as a chronic migraine. And in order to diagnose a patient with chronic migraine, they would have had to have had a headache for at least 15 days per month for at least three months. So they would have had to meet the criteria we just talked about in the last two slides. So either migraine without aura or a migraine with aura. And they would have had to experience those headache symptoms for at least 15 days per month for at least three months. So they would have had to have had at least five headaches that meet previous criteria, as we mentioned before. With migraine without aura, they have to have had at least five attacks. And there are some other considerations when diagnosing migraine headaches, and these include whether or not neuroimaging is required. If there are red flag signs and symptoms, for instance, if there's a sudden onset of a new headache, oftentimes later on in life, so older patients that have a new headache, this is oftentimes going to be a red flag. If there's going to be some focal neurologic deficits that occur with the headache as well, this can also be a red flag as well. So if you want to learn more about red flag signs and symptoms of a headache, please check out my lesson on that topic. And now treatment of migraine headaches oftentimes can start with lifestyle modification. So identification and avoidance of triggers is often going to be very important for patients. Regular physical activity. So when they're not having a migraine headache, regular physical activity can be important and can help reduce the likelihood and severity of migraine headaches in the future, and then stress reduction. Stress reduction is important because stress can be a trigger of migraine headaches as well. Clinicians can treat migraine headaches with what we call abortive therapy. Abortive therapy is a treatment that is given when the patient has a migraine headache to abort that migraine headache. If a patient is experiencing a migraine headache that is mild without nausea and vomiting, 
Oftentimes, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like NSAIDs, so ibuprofen or Advil, diclofenac, and naproxen are important to use for migraine headaches. Another class of medication that can be used to abort a migraine headache include the triptans, so the triptan medications all have triptan as a suffix in their name, and the triptans are 5-HT1 agonists. So I showed the 5-HT1 receptor earlier on in this lesson, so activating that receptor can modulate a lot of the release of those vasoactive neuropeptides we talked about before. Some of the triptan medications include sumatriptan, virizotriptan, zomatriptan, nerotriptan, and almotriptan. But it's important to recognize that triptans should not be used in patients with cardiovascular disease, pregnant patients, and patients with poorly controlled hypertension. And it's not to be used for more than 10 days per month. And then anti-nauseans and anti-emetics can also be used. So because a lot of times patients can have issues with nausea and vomiting, so using medication to reduce our nausea is important. And another class of medication that can be used as an abortive therapy for migraine headaches is the ergots. And one of those is dihydroergotamine. So those were the abortive therapies. Now let's talk about the preventive therapies. So taking these medications will reduce the risk for getting migraine headaches in the future. And the preventive therapies are used in the following types of cases. If a patient has many or very long-lasting headaches, if they have particular types of migraine headaches, like hemiplegic and menstrual migraines, and if there's a contradiction to use of abortive therapy. So these are a lot of times going to be some of the cases where a patient may utilize preventive therapy. And some of these preventive therapies include the beta blockers like metoprolol and propanolol, Calcium channel blockers like verapamil can be used. Some antidepressants can be used like amitriptyline. And then in some cases, anticonvulsants can be used like valproate. So if you want to learn more about dietary and environmental triggers of migraine headaches, please check out my full lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.